Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is weapons inspections. Let's get to it. Previously, we've talked about how one of the main roles of the International Atomic Energy Agency is to safeguard nuclear technology. That word is a little bit misleading. When you have nuclear safeguards, you don't actually have a physical presence of guards at nuclear stations controlled by the IAEA at all times. Meanwhile, some would contend that they're not particularly safe either, with India having previously used civilian nuclear assistance to help bolster their nuclear weapons program. And recent failures of weapons inspectors to get information about Iraq in an adequate time frame have further cast doubt on the utility of safeguards in general. Nevertheless, by the end of this lecture, I want you to have a deeper appreciation of what weapons inspections do, and how it might be difficult to ascertain the effectiveness of weapons inspections based off of what you hear in the news. In particular, we have a problem with the dog that didn't bark. When dogs are happy, they're quiet. When they're upset, they make lots of noise. Similarly, when weapons inspections fail, you tend to hear all about it. But when weapons inspections are succeeding and Atoms for Peace programs are functioning as intended, you tend not to hear about it. Put simply, Taiwan using nuclear fuel to run a power plant is not headline news. Let's pause for a moment and get a deeper appreciation of the challenges that weapons inspectors face. We've talked before about the dual-use nature of lots of nuclear technologies. The types of systems and information and knowledge that you need to run a nuclear power plant are very similar to the types of technologies and knowledge and facilities that you need to have a nuclear weapon. Every pathway toward a nuclear weapon begins with some sort of source of uranium. Under modern Atoms for Peace programs, there's a strict accounting of that fuel. The fuel that is sent to a nuclear power plant abroad is then returned as spent fuel to be investigated to make sure that none of it has been siphoned off. In other words, every little piece of fuel that is supposed to be there is actually there. Measurement errors can cause some problems here, but for the most part, this accounting system works. And even if a state were to cheat the accounting system, it would have to build a native facility, either to enrich uranium or reprocess plutonium, to actually make progress on a bomb. In short, the exchange system is fairly robust. The deeper problem is, in fact, those native programs. Imagine that you wanted to develop a nuclear weapon on your own. Broadly, there are two ways you can go about doing this. Under the first option, you take naturally occurring uranium and run it through an enrichment procedure. That's because naturally occurring uranium is less than 1% of the fissile uranium-235 isotope. Putting it through a uranium centrifuge, for example, allows you to concentrate that isotope. And when you get up to 90% of uranium-235, then you are ready to go with a nuclear weapon. Under the second pathway, you take naturally occurring uranium and run it through one of a few different types of nuclear reactors. Reactors that are moderated by graphite or heavy water, for example, can sustain a reaction with unenriched uranium. The waste products from those reactions will include plutonium. If you take the waste and have it undergo reprocessing, that can extract the plutonium, and then you can put that plutonium into a nuclear weapon. The problem for the nonproliferation regime is that there are legitimate, peaceful uses for both uranium enrichment and plutonium reprocessing facilities. Imagine for a moment you only wanted to have lots of nuclear power. Well, modern nuclear power plants, the safest type of nuclear power plants, run on low enriched uranium. You can't take the uranium that you get out of the ground and put it into one of these power plants and actually generate electricity. You need to do some sort of enrichment on that. 
you need to, for example, have uranium centrifuges spin that naturally occurring uranium and get up to about a 5% concentration of uranium-235. Like any other nuclear reactor, that power plant is going to generate nuclear waste. And that's where nuclear reprocessing has a legitimate function. If you run the waste fuel through a reprocessing facility, you can extract some of the impurities and get more of the uranium-235 out of there and put it back into good new fuel. Thus, if you want to maximize your use out of uranium-235 and minimize nuclear waste, then you need to have a reprocessing center. You might think to yourself that there is a way of figuring out what states are truly up to. I mentioned that low enriched uranium is necessary to run one of these modern power plants. That's only about 5% of uranium-235. In contrast, high enriched uranium, about 90% uranium-235, is necessary for a weapon. Thus, you might conclude, because 90% is larger than 5%, we could simply look at how sophisticated the uranium enrichment facility is and use that to determine whether the state has peaceful intentions or not. Unfortunately, that's just not how it works. It is true that uranium centrifuges can be used to produce both 5% or 90% uranium-235. It just depends on how long you run them. The problem is that if you're going to have your nuclear power plants be economically viable and be able to compete with other electricity sources, you have to be very efficient with your uranium-235 enrichment. If you're not, then it's simply going to take too much time, electricity, and money to fuel your nuclear power plants. As a result, having a more sophisticated facility, if anything, is evidence of peaceful intent, not weapons intent. Another way to comprehend this point is to jump back in time to the 1940s during the Manhattan Project. This was one of the facilities that the United States used to enrich its first uranium and it was the largest building in the world at the time. Having a building this big, having that much machinery, having that many people work in it, is not economically efficient to produce electricity. The only reason that you would produce a building this large is because you want to create a nuclear weapon. In contrast, having a facility like this is ambiguous. You could be using it to produce fuel for your nuclear power plant, or you simply could be running these centrifuges for longer to build a nuclear weapon. As a result, the focus of weapons inspections are on these types of facilities, uranium enrichment and plutonium reprocessing. If you can verify that uranium enrichment is only being done at low levels, and that the plutonium reprocessing facilities are not there to extract weapons-grade plutonium for the purposes of creating a nuclear weapon, then you shut off both of the pathways to a bomb. Monitoring those facilities in practice has been a bit of a challenge. The Non-Proliferation Treaty originally provided some guidance on this. The Non-Proliferation Treaty sets policies under something known as information circulars. Well, Information Circular 153 provides the guidance on how to conduct weapons inspections. And it says that the IAEA shall require only the minimum amount of information and data consistent with carrying out its responsibilities to verify that countries are not pursuing nuclear weapons. The IAEA's experience with Iraq prior to the Persian Gulf War in 1991 indicated that this simply was not good enough. This was especially true of facilities and materials that the countries in question had not voluntarily declared to the international community. The solution was to create an additional protocol to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, one that would allow greater coverage of declared facilities, as well as better access to facilities that had not been declared but were suspected by various members of the international community. As you can see, the vast majority of countries have agreed to this non-proliferation treaty expansion, although there are still a few holdouts. The key thing to note here is that there are a lot of countries in red with civilian nuclear programs, 
and as a consequence of being a part of the additional protocol, are subject to more stringent weapons inspections. Those countries continue with their civilian nuclear programs and don't try to build nuclear weapons. They are the dogs that did not bark. Part of the reason that this works is that the absence of information is actually information. That might seem a little puzzling, so let's go deeper. Imagine that you find in your rival country a facility that you suspect is being used for the purposes of developing a nuclear weapon. You can approach the IAEA and ask them to investigate that facility. If the IAEA then goes to your rival and tells them that they need access to the facility, and the rival denies them that access, then that might tell you everything that you need to know. If the facility was being used for legitimate peaceful purposes, then they would have let the IAEA in to verify that. But because they are not, the thing that you have to conclude is that it's being used for something that is probably not one of those peaceful purposes. And the fact that the absence of information is itself revealing might deter your rival state from engaging in this behavior in the first place. Meanwhile, even if all weapons inspections do is make sure that declared facilities are not being used for the purposes of developing nuclear weapons, they may be helpful. By taking these facilities off the table, it forces potential proliferators to construct other facilities for the purposes of developing a nuclear weapon. That has the effect of making a nuclear weapon more expensive. This can be especially helpful in situations involving secret nuclear weapons programs. In the past, we've analyzed a scenario where a potential proliferator must choose whether to build a nuclear weapon or not, and in the dark, the opponent must choose whether to prevent or not. If the potential proliferator finds the investment to be worth the cost, and the opponent prefers preventive war to allowing a power shift to transpire, then we end up in a conundrum. We can't anticipate that war will always happen, otherwise the potential proliferator would choose not to waste the cost of the investment. But we can't have a preventive war occurring without a weapon being built, because that's a waste of cost of war. We can't have the status quo be maintained, because if the opponent is not launching a preventive war, the potential proliferator prefers to build. And we can't have the building always happening either, because then the opponent would prefer to shift to fighting a preventive war instead. The way that this gets resolved depends on how costly it is to build nuclear weapons. If it's very cheap to develop nuclear weapons, then we have no deal reached ahead of time, and both of the actors choosing each of those actions with positive probability. In other words, the opponent sometimes initiates a preventive war and sometimes does not, and the potential proliferator sometimes builds a nuclear weapon and sometimes does not. This results in lots of inefficiency, both from the development of the weapon as well as the cost for war. If only we made nuclear weapons more expensive, then both the opponent and the potential proliferator would ultimately fare better. This is where weapons inspections can help. If weapons inspections shut down known facilities and force potential proliferators to build nuclear weapons in secret in a new facility that they'll have to spend more money on separate from their current facilities, well, that has the effect of shifting us further to the right and potentially increasing both of the players' payoffs. That's not to say that weapons inspections are perfect. The lead-up to the Iraq War shows a couple of problems that Saddam Hussein had with implementation. For one, Saddam was concerned that U.S. intelligence might infiltrate the IAEA. And thus, when the IAEA went to inspect facilities, they may pass off information to the United States, which would allow the United States to be better equipped to fight and win a war against Iraq. The other concern Saddam had was with Iran. Saddam wanted to maintain the appearance of being able to build nuclear weapons as a way of striking fear into Tehran. But that ran in direct opposition of the incentives that he faced with the United States, 
where the ability to produce nuclear weapons would have resulted in the U.S. trying to invade. As a result, you was caught between a rock and a hard place. That wraps up this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.